Hey guys, I uh, hope you're doing well. Just wanted to share with you quickly what I've been working on. Got a couple things that I finished up this week. And I also want to talk a little bit about whether the uh, wargaming hobby is dying. So the first thing I got done this week is this unit of Tarantine Lucasfides or Tarantine White Shields. So these guys are going to be mainly for my Pyrrhic army. Uh, but they, you know, they can sub in to a couple other armies as well. So these guys are uh, basically when Pyrrhus of Epirus, who's a cousin of Alexander the Great, he was invited to uh, Italy to help the, one of the Greek cities there, the city of Tarentum, uh, modern day Taranto, which even though it was in Italy, it was uh, colonized by Greeks. So it had a Greek population and uh, they kind of expected him to do all the fighting for them. But uh, when he went over there, he basically drafted a bunch of the citizens uh, into the army and trained them up to fight uh, in the Macedonian fashion in a pike phalanx. So, um, and kind of these, uh, there's kind of some evidence. So they were called white shields and there's some evidence kind of more levy units um, in Macedonian armies had white shields. So um, yeah, I, these guys are pikemen. I really wanted to kind of show the levy nature of these guys. So I wanted them uh, bunched up really tight and kind of losing the cohesion of the formation. Uh, usually when I do my pikemen, I do them in ordered rows. These guys, uh, I'm kind of imagining this is the first time uh, they've seen battle. They did end, it, uh, end up breaking in one of their battles. And you know, they're starting to take some casualties um, they're starting to get a little disordered, um, you know, they're forgetting their training. So that's kind of the, uh, the look I wanted to go for these guys. Um, I used a bunch of kind of spare miniatures I have from different manufacturers. There is Victrix in here, there is Aventine, there is Warlord Games stuff, there's War Games Foundry stuff. Um, and some of these guys, some of the guys in here aren't even, you know, technically pikemen. Uh, this guy in the front is like a War Games Foundry hoplite. Um, you know, there's a few of those in there that I just gave different shields and spears. This guy is actually a uh, Victrix uh, Republican Roman guy that I drilled out and gave a pike. Uh, and then there are some like Aventine Thuriothori that, yeah, I just gave different shields and pikes to. So I think this unit turned out pretty well. Definitely what I would call a speed paint. Um, you know, I really just wanted to get this unit done. I didn't really spend a ton of time on them. Um, but I think, you know, units like this, once you pack all the figures together, they tend to look pretty good, even if the standard for the individual figures is kind of low. And um, yeah, for the, the banner, the kind of emblem of Tarantum that you see, can see on coins are uh, is the dolphin. So they have their dolphin standard. And then the shields, I just went with kind of classic. I had these transfers lying around and I wanted to use them up. So they have the white kind of shields with the Macedonian star. And there's actually uh, Tarantine coins that have the, the, you know, the Macedonian star on them. So I thought that was fine. And these units can, you know, this unit will be able to sub into my other armies too. Um, even though they have some of those Italian style helmets, I don't really care. Um, you know, the Antigonid army had a, you know, a unit had a large number of white shields in the phalanx. And there is a little debate um, whether these were actually pikemen or not. I think they were pikemen. Um, you know, Nicholas Secunda has kind of an argument that they weren't, um, but I think, you know, he's kind of mainly just trying to be controversial there. Um, you know, I think the evidence really does suggest that they were pikemen, and these were, you know, only seem to have been called up for home defense of Macedonia. They're not really featured in uh, foreign, camp you know, campaigns um, where the Antigonids were marching into Greece. So I think they're more kind of the older guys who are kind of drafted in. And since they had already served in the, the Phalanx, I don't think it really would have made sense for them to suddenly be re-equipped as Thuriophori, even though they'd spent, um, you know, 
years before serving in uh, the other regiments. That just doesn't make sense to me, especially if they're older guys, they're going to do better fighting in a, you know, a formation than they are in the more individual fighting style of the theory of four. You know, if you're an old guy, you know, there's more strength wielding a pike and a big pike block than, you know, fighting with a shorter spear and sword. So that's just my two cents anyways. So next up, what we got done is Pyrrhus of Epirus here um, to lead the Pyrrhic army. Forest mandatory purple cloak and um, the descriptions of him in, uh, you know, the accounts, he had this towering helmet of crests with goat horns. So I wanted to, uh, you know, make sure. So yeah, this is an Aventine and those goat helmets are such a cool feature. A lot of the, the monarchs in this area either had goat horned helmets or um, bull horn helmets. So yeah, I wanted to feature that really awesome model. And this guy, you know, can really serve as any number of uh, Hellenistic monarchs. But what a great pose, what a great figure. Um, if you're into successor stuff, definitely check out Aventine. This, um, you know, they just have some really cool stuff. And then last up here, we got, uh, this guy is gonna be one of my Phalanx commanders, um, or, you know, my the Phalanx commander for my successor armies. And the unit he's gonna go with, I don't think I've shown them off on camera, but they're, you know, mainly in red and, um, there is a line, I think it is in Livy, that, uh, you know, describes the elite Macedonian troops in red cloaks. So that red theme is something I really wanted to come through. The uh, figure in the middle pointing is a Aventine miniature. And those, um, the helmet he's wearing, that Konos type helmet with the two plumes, that's actually featured on a lot of Macedonian coins. Um, and that's one thing I really like about Aventine is they really um, you know, research the equipment so thoroughly. And then the two guys on either side are War Games Foundry from their Greek and Macedonian ranges. So yeah, that, I thought um, this would be a cool little base. And I do, so I've started doing these half circle bases for my um, Macedonian troops. I mean, for my um, attached leaders, because I basically only play to the strongest and uh, I really want, they, you know, there are two kinds of generals, attached and detached. All the uh, Macedonian generals are attached. So these half circle bases just fit really nicely on the front of a unit. And, uh, you know, you can just tell that they're, you know, they have to stick with the unit. I think that, um, you know, that's a nice system because with the circuit, and then I reserved the full circle bases for detached commanders who can move around the battlefield. And I think this is a really uh, nice feature because, um, you know, that it, you know, it really differentiates the tactical styles of different armies. Um, you know, like when you're Alexander the Great and you're literally, you know, attached to your companion cavalry and you have to lead them from the front, you don't necessarily have the, uh, the ability to move around the battlefield and rally other sections of the army. Um, and, you know, it really differentiates, you know, like Caesar, he's always moving around the battlefield. So, you know, I really love that uh, idea in the rules. So very quickly, I wanted to talk about what's going been going around is uh, Wargaming Dying. And I think, you know, um, some other people have said it, like Ranger Miniatures and Wargaming is all the people in the UK um, think the hobby's going really strong and the... In the U.S., things are a little more pessimistic, and I think that's very true. I don't think the hobby is exactly uh, healthy in the U.S. And I think, uh, you know, the U.K. just has a real advantage in that it's just so much more a part of the culture there. I actually uh, spent some time in the U.K. in the 90s, and I just feel like this kind of thing was everywhere. Um, you didn't even have to be into the, you know, interested in this stuff to still see it around. You know, people's houses who I would go to, um, you know, they just had some kind of like model soldiers laying around. Um, Games Workshop was like 
you know, and, you know, mainstream stores too. Um, you know, that's how I feel like I first saw this stuff was, you know, in like, not even in the hobby store and just, uh, you know, whatever, some regular department store seeing those like boxed um, Warhammer sets and stuff. So I think it's just much more present there. Um, and I think the big stumbling block in the U.S. for history is that, you know, the average American is not interested in history. Um, there's no real, you know, so with ancient specifically too, that's like an old world thing. Um, you know, and it's important even in England, even, uh, you know, there's this idea that, uh, you know, the British Empire was, you know, going back to classical times in a way. And, uh, you know, the Romans had a presence in Britain. So, you know, there's this kind of connection into the Roman stuff. In the U.S., you know, we're more removed, even though our government is in many ways based on, um, you know, the founding fathers were really into classics. Our government is in many ways based on, you know, Roman ideas. Uh, you know, it's just not very present in American society. Uh, you know, we have very few old buildings. You know, I live in a town that's actually a, you know, it's a Victorian town still, a lot of historical buildings. But, you know, the next town over, there's like no historical buildings. Everything is from the 50s or 60s forward. It's kind of, uh, you know, there's no, you know, you know, get no sense of history at all just from driving through some of these towns because everything and literally everything is like 1950s, 60s built onwards and that stuff is just not really designed, you know, aesthetically or anything. And there are tons of historical homes in my state, um, which kind of generate interest. But again, even these homes, like most of them are from uh, you know, the, the 1860s, which, uh, you know, in the UK terms is pretty, uh, recently there are older colonial homes and stuff as well, but you know, there just isn't that presence of history so much. You have to kind of, you know, look out for it. And as well, while I was in the UK, um, you know, there's just so much more of an idea of how important history has been to the development of that, com that country. Uh, you know, History is, seems well covered in the, you know, the British curriculum, at least when I was there. And, you know, there's just so much more exposure to history. The United States, right now, you do not do any history in elementary school at all. The entire focus is pretty much just on reading, writing, and math in elementary school. Uh, that is pretty much, like, literally all they do. And even though that's like all we do, somehow we still are terrible at those things. Um, you know, kids in the fourth grade cannot read or write. I mean, I'm being serious. Um, you know, even in high school now, um, we have kids coming in who can't write a paragraph. So um, serious flaws in the US, and I think that kind of lack of interest in history and just having no conception of history, even, uh, you know, American history, you know, people have no idea when the Civil War happened, when the, even when the American Revolution was, how old the country actually is, um, you know, when we kind of have that level of ignorance, I think it's hard for people to get into this historical stuff because they have no context at all. You know, so I think the one um, kind of beacon of hope in a way is that, you know, the Games Workshop stuff is popular. I think as long as people are still kind of painting and modeling, you know, you have a pool of people with the skills that can transition over to historicals possibly in one day. But again, um, I'd be interested in, um, you know, what... Uh, the actual makeup of people in Games Workshop is. Um, you know, I see things saying they're trying to cater to a younger audience. I think most of the people with doing Games Workshop stuff right now are my age in their late 20s and 30s, not younger people. Um, you know, people like me who, you know, as a kid, I was pretty into the Games Workshop stuff. And that was mainly because, you know, I was actually interested in history even as a teen, but like, the Warhammer Empire stuff or Bretonia was like the closest to 
a historical army I feel like you could really get. So, um, and then, you know, I kind of, as a teenager, lost interest in this stuff and kind of got back into it recently. I think a lot of, um, you know, the Games Workshop boost of people right now is people who are interested in it when they were young and now we're getting back into it. I don't really think there's a ton of really young kids getting into Games Workshop right now. And I think part of that is like the price. I mean, it is insanely expensive. Um, you know, even, you know, I've been kind of interested in Space Marines or something. They, you know, it's kind of that nostalgia factor. Um, and then I look at the cost. It's like, I'm not spending money on that for pieces of plastic. Um, especially when I can get like those Games Workshop plastic figures. They're like $6 per figure. It's like, I'm not you know, spending my money on that. It's just insane when even I can buy metal figures for a fraction of that cost uh, that are historical. You know, I can build an entire historical army for like, what, um, you know, a 20 man squad or something of Games Workshop stuff. So yeah, that's just my quick two cents. Um, in terms of, you know, how do you build back up historicals in the US, I think you know, that's an interesting question. Um, and I think I'm going to do some videos, um, you know, trying to give people an idea of how to get started in Ancients. Um, but anyways, that's the end of my rambling. hope you like this stuff. Um, and uh, see you next time.